Jesus said to the disciples, follow me. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But how do you really follow someone? Is that a decision that you make? Or is it a, a direction that you go? Who is the world following? And do they even know? Maybe the bigger question, maybe the more important one, is who are you following? Jesus says to you, follow me. So Jesus says, follow me. And over the next several weeks, we're going to seek to follow Jesus. And a part of understanding what following Jesus looks like, that's going to be the key to this story for us. Those of us, many of you, you've been around church for a long time, and you've heard lots of sermons, and you've been in lots and lots of Bible studies. The issue for, for most people who are regular churchgoers is not understanding it's obedience. But, but here's where the difficulty comes in. We have substituted in church life knowing what we should do for actually doing something. And that's especially true in spiritual things. And really, the best thing a whole lot of people could do who've been a Christian for a whole lot of years is to stop going to another Bible study and start doing something with what you know. And just say, I'm going to obey what he told me to do. Because we've elevated... Bible information to hear, and obedience is somewhere way down here. And this is one of the great needs of the church today. Stop going to Bible studies and start doing something with what God has said to you to do. It's not going to get any easier, by the way, for the next eight weeks than that. Because this has made the church in America the most anemic church in the world. It, we got to do better than this. And we want to stretch it out. You know, uh, Rhonda sent me to the Cooper Clinic a while back. I, I shared our, with our, this with our Wednesday night crowd. I was there for seven hours. I saw multiple doctors. If you've ever done the big Cooper Clinic down in Dallas, it's just an all-day extravaganza of poking and prodding. They tested me for everything there was to test me for. Rhonda was just making sure she had enough life insurance on me. <laughs> and one of the people I had to go see was a dietitian. I had to log everything I eat for a couple of weeks down to the amounts and the brands and all that stuff. Mail it in ahead of time so she would have, this dietitian would have this to go through this with me. You know, she said, it says here uh, a lot of days at lunch you have... Uh, sandwich and chips you said what was on the sandwich what you didn't give me anything on the chips how many how many chips what and I said a bag she said, what what size bag Chad I don't know whatever the big one is that Kroger sells I, it's about what I have and see 55 years of age, I know what I should do when it comes to my diet. I know what's bad for me and what's good for me. I know certain things I shouldn't eat. I shouldn't eat just before I go to bed. All these things that will make me a healthier person. I, 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 I have all this knowledge, but that's not the same thing as eating right. And when it comes to following Jesus, it's not just knowing what you ought to do and calling it quits there. It's doing something with what you know. This has resulted in a couple of illustrations here for you, this kind of Christian. One, one writer talked about it and said, we have embraced in our culture casual Christianity. And, and this is how it's defined. Casual Christianity is faith in moderation. Don't want to get too carried away. You don't want to be a fanatic. You don't want to be uh, uh, considered as odd by your, by your pagan friends. So, casual Christianity enables people to feel religious without having to prioritize their faith. Christianity is that, this way is low risk, a predictable proposition, providing a faith perspective that's not overly demanding. A casual Christian can be all things that they esteem. 
a nice human being, a family person. They can be considered religious by a lot of their friends and family, an exemplary citizen, a reliable employee, but never have to publicly defend or represent difficult moral or social positions or even lose much sleep over their private choices as long as they intend to do generally what is best. From the perspective of the casual Christian, their brand of faith practice is genuine, realistic, practical. To them, casual Christianity is the best of all worlds and encourages them to be a better person than if they had been irreligious, yet it's not a faith into which they feel compelled to heavily invest themselves. Okay, so last weekend was Easter weekend. Do you think that's what Jesus died for? You think he died for, for casual Christianity? For a carefully maintained, managed, containable expression of faith? Is that what Jesus expects? You know, when Jesus called his first disciples, he said, follow me. And we talked about a lifetime of discipleship. He, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And there's a cost, and there's a commitment, and it's for life. Some of you are familiar with this phrasing. And there's a book by this uh, title, too. Uh, but the phrasing is, are you, a, are you a follower of Jesus or are you a fan of Jesus? And you feel the difference in that? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a fan. Being a fan of Jesus is saying, oh, I love Jesus. Hashtag blessed. I love Jesus. Like, 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 like. Look how much I love Jesus. Well... <laughs> We're not asking in, uh, are you a follower of Jesus? If, oh, yeah, I go to church. That's not the question we're answering. It's, are you a follower of Jesus? My parents and grandparents, oh, our family, we have always been Christian people. It's not asking, uh, did you ever raise your hand at the end of an invitation? Uh, did you ever pray a prayer with a preacher? Did, uh, did you ever walk forward at camp to a 12-verse uh, version of Just As I Am? Do you own three or more Bibles? That's not what we're asking. Have you ever appeared in a church directory? How many of you have ever appeared in a church directory? Well, that's not what we're asking for. That's not what a follower of Jesus is. It's going to take a whole lot more than that. Did you grow up going to vacation Bible school and camp? That's not, what it, that's not the mark of a follower of Jesus. Is your ringtone a worship song? Do you understand Christianese? If I say traveling mercies, do you go, oh, yeah, I know what that's about? Crazy Christian phrasing. The point is, many people are quick to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and I've posed that question to a whole lot of people over time. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? And overwhelmingly, there are people all over who say, Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But to quote, to quote uh, periodically, I love to quote this particular theologian, one of the great theologians of all time from the Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya, who said, I do not think that means what you think it means. And when it comes to being a follower of Christ, one of the things we're going to work on in this series is a biblical definition because I think we have self-identified as followers of Jesus and like uh, a lot of issues with self-identifying, uh, I don't think it's all that true. One, uh, one person said that there comes a point in a relationship to God where you have to have the, the DTR talk. And I like that, that concept. You, you got to have the DTR talk when it comes to God. And are you really a follower of Jesus, or do you even want to be? Now, I say the DTR talk, and some of you, what in the world is he talking about now? And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I want to give you some help. Let's say there's a young man. This young man is in a romantic relationship with a young woman. Let's say they're in college. The DTR talk is what strikes fear into his heart. 
It's the thing that undoes him. It's the thing that, that pressures him. He'll put off this talk as long as possible. Before I met Rhonda, I had a couple of relationships with different ladies that uh, we got down to the DTR talk and it was really awkward. The, the DTR talk stands for define the relationship. You know, if you have that in a dating relationship, where is this for real? Where is this going? How long do I need? I mean, are, 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 is this leading to something or is it just a dating relationship? Define the relationship. And it's a big step in commitment. Today, we're going to talk about defining the relationship. And we're going to begin a journey on following Jesus. And one thing is clear. In the scriptures, which is our authority for what it looks like to walk in a relationship to God, a relationship to God cannot be somewhat important. You cannot truly be a disciple and just be sort of a disciple, kind of committed. To be a disciple is to be a follower. And you can't be a follower of Jesus Christ if the truth of the relationship is you're not following. Really, the whole sermon was a children's sermon. It covered all the bases of all the things we substitute for actually following Jesus. I think sometimes when it comes to God, we do like to def define the relationship ourselves. But when we talk about a relationship to God, it is always God who defines what the relationship looks like. Now, I'm, a, I'm a committed Christian. I've met so many people. I'm a committed Christian. I love Jesus. Okay, that's awesome. There's nothing, nothing in your life that reflects this book. Nothing in your life that reflects the priority of Christ. Nothing in your life that reflects the cross of Christ. And so somewhere in the mix, you've misdefined what you believe to be a relationship to God that may not be true at all. It has to be more than casual Christianity, and it has to be more than being a fan of Jesus. So what does it look like to, to, and these are the things that we'll talk about over the next several weeks. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus? And how do you make somebody else? How do you make a disciple? Because this is the great priority, the great commission, make disciples of all nations. We better know what it is to be one, and then we're, we're better equipped to know what it is to make one. So... We're going to read today from the gospel according to Mark. And just to give you some uh, variety, uh, we'll probably spend the next two Sundays in this same passage. Here is uh, Mark chapter, I'm going to back up to verse 14 of chapter 1 of Mark's gospel. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, who's the brother of Simon. This is Simon Peter. Simon casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So what is a disciple? When you look at the New Testament, you're going to find the word disciple showing up about 269 times. That's how it comes out in my my translation, 269 times. By way of contrast, the word Christian shows up three times in the Bible. Now, we like to identify as I'm a Christian. The Bible likes to use the word disciple, and that's why we're leaning into the word disciple in this series. What is a disciple? When the New Testament talks about disciples, one of the things you'll find is that there are three different contexts where the where the word shows up. Three different ways that disciple is used in the New Testament. And there's a dramatic difference between the three. So I want, to, uh, I want to run through these. First of all, when you see the New Testament talk about disciples, sometimes it's just referring to a casual listener. These are the times when it'll say Jesus is speaking to disciples, but there's a multitude. It's a mass of people. 
And they are, they're not buying in. Uh, they're just crowds and they're interested. I wonder what he's talking about. I wonder who this guy is. They're a little bit curious uh, about what he's saying. They're casual listeners. The second group takes you a step deeper. Uh, these people also refer to sometimes as disciples. And they're more, more along the lines, not just of a casual listener, but a convinced listener. And the convinced listeners, they tend to approach Jesus as, I think there's some real truth in that. This guy may actually be who he says he is. I think there's some things, there's some takeaways for me from what this guy has to say. He's an amazing uh, teacher. And so there's some belief. They're embracing some of what he's saying. Convinced, maybe he is who he says he is. They're convinced listeners. But the third group, get to a completely different level. And they're not just casual or convinced listeners, but they have gotten to be committed, lifelong learners and followers. And they're described as disciples in the New Testament. Committed, lifelong learners and followers. And what's interesting in the New Testament is all these, of all these references to disciples, the greatest number of people who are referred to as disciples are from category one and two. The casual listener, the uh, more heavily invested, convinced listener with some buy-in. But when you get to that third group of people, the committed, lifelong learner, follower, that group gets really small. And that's why as you follow Jesus through his ministry, in the first part, when he's feeding the multitudes and all that stuff, there are huge crowds. But when he starts talking about what it means to truly be a follower, truly be a disciple, that, that number just begins to shrink down. And it ties in with what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, the, the, way, the, the, way is, the gate is narrow, the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. When you get down to that last category, you're in a small number of people and here's the part that, that we, have to, we have to step up to. That third group are the only ones who actually belong to Jesus Christ. They're the only one of the three groups that would call themselves disciples, who are referred to even as disciples, who've made a commitment to Jesus that's going to lead to forgiveness of sin, a real relationship to God, and eternal life in heaven. That's not true for the first two. They're just interested. They're just casual observers. So the question is, okay, well, so the three categories here referred to as disciples in the scriptures, which one am I? And, and which one do I really want to become? Probably uh, the majority, the multitudes, even who might call themselves Christian when it comes to this word disciples, would be casual listeners. I go along with Jesus and the church thing. More particularly because of the part of the country we live in where cultural Christianity, while it has changed dramatically in the last 25 years, not as popular as it once was to say, well, you ought to go just because you go. In our culture, we'll talk to a lot of people in our community that they're, they're the listener that, oh yeah, Jesus, cross, yeah, I believe that, probably true. Uh, I, I got no problem with... Which there's some buy-in. I believe Jesus is who he said he was. But they're content to just go on living any way they want to live. I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to live like I live. I'm going to prioritize what I prioritize. But I'm still going to periodically slap on a, I'm a Christian name tag. And that's different than being saved, born again, going to heaven when you die. And therein is our challenge. What I want to say to you today, based on the authority of the Word of God, is that, I, you know, I just want to be a part of a church that's impacting the world with the goodness of Christ for the glory of Christ. I, I, want, to, I want to be a part of a redeemed church membership. I want to be a part of a church that is really living this out. And we have been leaning into this since January in a, in a big way. And we are seeing God do wonderful things and seeing God open doors that have not been opened in a lot of lives before, for a long time. And, and I'm so proud of you for leaning into this and taking big steps. And I want to encourage you to keep on taking big steps. 
Time is short, the world is broken, and we need a whole lot more than casual or just somewhat convinced people when it comes to Jesus, Jesus Christ. We need committed, lifelong learners and followers who are embracing him and are passionate about making the true Jesus of the Bible known to our community and to the ends of the earth. Now, before we get there, we're going to spend some time with people who are doing this in the Bible. And we want to look at Jesus. One of the good things about Jesus is he never said, it's going to be awesome being my follower and you'll always have fun. And you'll never have any problems, and you'll never be hard, and you'll never be uncomfortable. Let's go! Oh, Jesus said, there's a cost. And I want you to understand what the cost is. That's how Jesus presented this. And I want, I want you to understand the cost of discipleship, the cost of being one of his people. There's a cost. It's not nearly as big as the cost of not. But we're going to take a look being disciples. And we're going to look at this from Mark chapter 1. And I want to note some things about this passage just today, just real quick. And so Jesus comes on this scene. This is probably not the first time Jesus crossed paths with these four guys. Uh, Most most Bible Bible scholar folk believe that John 1 is probably the first, describes the first time he crossed paths with them. The first time he got into a conversation with them. This is maybe the third or beyond. We don't have that even the scriptures point to, where he's gotten into a conversation with these guys. They have seen him. They have experienced him. They have heard him teach. They have seen him do some miracles. And now, there's a lot of room. They've had some time to consider. So this gives us a picture of these guys being introduced to Jesus. And Jesus comes to them and he says, follow me. Now next week we'll pick up the last part of that calling. This week, follow me. Come after me is the literal phrasing of it. And in those words, we just unpack what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. As Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, he happens upon these four guys, and we see him call them to himself. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And we see that there's a process. And, and Jesus invites them not to, in a, not to a moment, but to a process, to a journey, to follow to walk with him, to listen to him, to serve with him, to be trained by him. And it's a journey, and he takes us through the process. It it has to be initiated at a point, and here it's initiated in Mark 1, and has a lot to teach us about the steps. Here's the first thing that uh, I note in this. In our lives, Jesus takes the initiative. It says he, he chose, he chose us. He chose them. He chooses us. This is so different from the way things worked in the world in Jesus' day. If there was a rabbi, people who thought they were qualified would approach the teacher, the rabbi, and say, could we be one of your disciples? Could we follow you? Could we sit at your feet? Could we learn from you? We want to be in that environment. And they would approach the rabbi. But that's not how Jesus, how Jesus does this. What we see here is not these guys going to Jesus, but we see Jesus going to these guys. And Jesus initiates a relationship. And it's a pattern we see repeated throughout the scriptures. That God's God's always choosing. He reaches out and he chooses uh, Abraham. Or for that Noah. Or Moses. Or David. Or the people of Israel as as a nation. He calls them out. He chooses them to be with him. He calls to them, and he calls to us. Jesus didn't post a sign-up sheet uh, down at the local synagogue, tape something at the door that says, hey, if you'd like to be my follower, sign up here like he's recruiting a softball team. Come if you can. If it works out in your busy schedule, be a part of it. And looking for a group of uh, handy volunteers instead He selects them. In John 15, here's what Jesus says. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. He chose and he had an expectation that there was going to be something that came out of it. And this is just a radical picture of the grace demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Grace, 
where he initiates the relationship with these guys and with us. He reaches out to us not because of who we are, because of who he is. And I want you to remind you of this part. None of us in this room is able to be a follower of Jesus Christ apart from the initiative and the grace of a gracious God who reaches out to us and into our lives. And not one of us deserves to be in his family, to be a disciple, to be a follower. It's not because of our qualifications. He has chosen to pour out his grace on us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we, we, were, we had a great resume, not because we were so highly qualified, Think about these guys. They, had, they really had nothing to bring to the table. You get these four, uh, they're, they're, they're not that bright, not that qualified. They're Galileans for one thing. Galileans were considered social outcasts. A little, that was the backwater. Choose your favorite state that you'd like to think of being like that in the United States. Say it to your neighbor that's from that state. See how they feel about it. But that's how the Judeans and the people around Jerusalem, that's how they talked about Galileans. They were outsiders, nobodies, commoners, and even spiritually. Jesus didn't grab these guys because he said, boy, these guys really tuned in to spiritual stuff. Man, they've got it going. They were arrogant, really narrow-minded, extremely ethnocentric. They they loved Jewish people, but they hated Gentiles. Not quite the people that you want to go out and make disciples of all nations, they, they could barely get along with one another, much less reach the whole world. You always see them, you think about, okay, here are these disciples, they're going along with Jesus because Jesus needed them to help him. And they're an anchor Jesus is dragging most of the time. You see that every time you turn around with these guys. They're just a constant burden that he's having to untie the knots they, they're tying up in their own hearts and, and between one another. He didn't call them because of what they brought to the table. Here's what Jesus did. He took the weakest and the lowliest, those who were just nobody. People ne- others would never have expected, and he chose them, and his plan really hasn't changed that much. Now, how does that make you feel? You're pretty encouraged? Man, if you're a true believer in Christ, it's not because you're awesome. It's because he took what was broken, and he makes all things new. Here's what Paul said to the people in Corinth, it's the same idea. Paul wrote, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many of you powerful, not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is not a compliment, by the way, to people who are church folk. God chose you, and he calls you out, not because of all that you brought to the table, but because of who he is. Not one of us is here because of what we bring to God. We're here because of our weakness. And, and, and that, the great part about that is God, it puts us all in the same spot. The Bible says the ground is low, you know, we, the, the, the phrasing, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. It's not because I got a great resume and that's why I'm here. You got a, this resume and that's why you're here. We all come as sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And we have nothing eternal to offer to God. But God has everything to offer to us. So God delights in showing his power. That's how Paul's talking about it. His power in our weakness. His strength when we are weak. And that's good news. Because it means... It's not on me, it's not on you, it's on Him. We're completely dependent upon the grace of an extremely gracious God. We're not qualified to do all this stuff that He calls us to do. It's not because I, I, we're so very capable. We're, we're called to be dependent on Him and to follow. To, add, to do what He's asked us to do and not stop short of doing everything he asks us to do. And so, what does he say to them? He says, follow me. And that next part, uh, there's there's an important word in there. Follow me and I will make you. He's going to make them fishers of men. He's going to make them into a lot of stuff. It's like the potter at the wheel. He is molding something that's just a glob of clay into something beautiful. And he is going to make 
something of them, make something of us. And these guys, think about making them fishers of men. That's a real stretch. He's, we're going to talk about this next week. He wants to do the same thing in us. And I look at these guys, and they're anything but passionate about the kingdom of God. They don't give a rip about anything but themselves. Like most people, they're just absorbed in, hey, we've got to catch some fish so we can sell some fish, so we can feed our family, so we can stay in business, so we can have a house, so we can survive. And They didn't have any clue what the kingdom of God even involved. But Jesus, he goes through a process where he takes them, he takes the initiative to choose them, He then provides the grace that he can use them to impart, he's going to impart compassion and gentleness and humility and all these these characteristics that are not natural to sinful hearts. He's going to give them all these things and enable them to proclaim the gospel. And this was all his work in them, making them into what he wants them to be. Now, why was it designed this way? Why did Jesus bother to do all this? He takes the initiative to choose us and provides the power to use us so that he can get the glory through us. Because it's not about us. And look how great we are, and look how smart we are, and look how talented we are, and look how many Bible verses we can quote, and look how well I can argue uh, Bible trivia, but it's in our weakness, as God uses us, that God gets all the glory. And and this is the great thing that we see in the disciples' lives. This is one of the things I, I so appreciate about the disciples, because here's Peter, You know Peter in the Bible, Simon in Mark's gospel, Jesus names him Peter. Peter was born with a a foot-shaped mouth. And you get to Acts chapter 2, and this guy who is impulsive, who is narrow-minded, who has so many deficits in his basic character of his uh, structure of his character he gets up on the day of Pentecost and he preaches the first big Christian sermon and 3,000 people plus are saved. The church grows by about 2,500% in a day and it's all through this guy, the least qualified guy ever. John, one of these four guys, you follow him through the Gospels, he's always wanting to debate about which one is the greatest and he thinks he's pretty far up on that list of which one of the disciples is the most important, the best, most qualified. And Jesus uses this prideful guy And and also, kind of an angry guy. He wants to call down fire from heaven, destroy some people, just because they get a little crossways with his plans and what he thinks, uh, how he thinks things ought to work out. And it's this guy that that Jesus takes him through a journey, and he ends up writing all these books in the New Testament, like the Gospel of John, the Revelation, first, second, third John, books that bring people to make a commitment to Christ. And, and, and it's such an influencer in the early church. That this, is, this is the God. Thousands of years later, people are still reading the books he wrote, and people are coming to Christ. And you look at the other guys, and there's you know, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Andrew, James. They, they, they all scatter out across the world. Acts uh, 17.6, this is how this group of guys are accused. These are those guys that have turned the world upside down. Of all people to turn the world upside down. This bunch of yahoos. No qualifications. No no innate abilities that... uh, And yet. And and why does God do it that way? Because their their whole lives are just a testimony to God's glory. Jesus designed it that way so that only his power could answer for why they got the results they did. Why things happened the way they did. Do you remember it's in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John? All these crazy things are happening. Jesus already ascended back into heaven. They are preaching, and people are being healed, and lives are being transformed, and the church continues to grow, and they get arrested and pulled in, and the religious leaders, here's how they, they describe them. They look at them and say, how is this happening? How are these guys doing this? And they describe them this way. They're common They're uneducated. The only thing that's different about them is they've been with Jesus. 
And that's what it means to follow. To be a person that spends enough time with Jesus that, that Jesus' heart and Jesus' passion and Jesus' power just start overflowing into how we do life. And this is such a good news for us. And here's why. You know, I'm convinced, I'm convinced in, in our church, church is all over our land, but this is where we're working on it today. In our church, there are men and women and students where the adversary, Satan, has just convinced us, oh, you can't do this. You need to sit back. You, you, need, to, you need to just watch. You, you need to just listen. There's so many more things you need to build into your spiritual resume, and so many more skill sets you need to develop before you ever get around to doing anything that God has told you to do in His Word. This isn't for... That, that follow Jesus stuff, that's for other people. That's not for, for your garden variety Christians like me. I have too many weaknesses. I have too many failings to ever be used mightily for the kingdom of God. And, and so we, we've embraced a lie from the devil and it's rendered us useless. Maybe not useless, but at least not as useful as we should be for God's work in the world, and God's kingdom purpose. And I want to remind you that if that is what you believe, it's a lie straight from the devil because the beauty and truth of God's word is that it is our shortcomings and our weaknesses and the things we're not good at that make us exactly the tool that God can use to show his power and his glory and his strength most clearly. Because it's not about how impressive you are. It's about how impressive he is. And the way you get to experience how impressive he is working through you is follow. And to follow, you have to do something different than you're doing now. You have to get up from your blessed assurance that you've been sitting on maybe for decades and go and follow. We need to stop denying the power of Christ and start exp experiencing more of the power of Christ for the purpose of Christ because God has taken the initiative to choose us. He provides the power and the grace to use us so that God can get the glory through us you know my prayer for me and it's my prayer for you too is that is that we I love that phrase you know to be a trophy of grace that we're just people people look and say I don't know how that guy ever got anything done but somehow God's been able to work through and they don't see it as me and they won't see it as you and they won't see it as us working together they'll say only God could do it with that group of people that's a work of God, and God gets all the credit. And I also like the word trophy of grace. Man, I don't want to be a purple participant ribbon of grace. Uh, it ought to be bigger, and it ought to be better than that. So if God could use those guys to accomplish what he did through them, what might God do for us to spread his glory? And what did just these four guys do? They just said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon my plan and I'm going to follow Jesus. And, and that doesn't mean you have to quit your job. Uh, they quit their job and that was a unique calling for them. You have to quit your job to do this. You don't have to move to deepest, darkest Africa to do this necessarily. But you do need to say, I'm going to get up from just talking about it, thinking about it, hearing about it, and I'm going to take a step of faith to follow Jesus Christ. And what happened is, Jesus didn't say, uh, follow me and I'm just going to turn you loose on the world and good luck with that. But he took him and he cared for him and he helped him untie those knots inside of him, knots between each other, helped him to get better relationships, helped him to have a bigger worldview. He, he modeled what he did. Then he'd send him out two by two to go practice that. Then he'd pull him back in. And they'd do some debriefing on what happened. And then he'd send him out again. And they practiced it because he trained them to do what he wanted them to do. And they turn the world upside down. And the world is the world's just too broken and too lost and too far from God for us to just let that be. 
It is 10.02. As alarms go off around the building, and I thank the Lord that you're doing this, Luke 10.2, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray the Lord for harvest. We'll send out labors to the harvest. Let's pray that as followers of Jesus Christ, we would we'd just be willing to take a step to follow, actually follow Jesus and not just in our minds, but with our hearts, with our feet, with our actions, with our commitment.